gives me great pleasure to introduce my uh, colleague and uh, refractive surgery chair, uh, Bud Culbertson. Buddy uh, was a star at uh, Vanderbilt University and then uh, came as a, a fellow at Baskin Palmer and he stayed on and has made history here, uh, leading us in so many ways. He's an innovator, one of the true credible leaders in femtosecond technology. He's going to talk to us about femtosecond lasers for astigmatic keratotomy. Buddy? Thanks, Terry. It's getting a little deep around here, but um, today I'm going to talk about uh, AK, stamping out astigmatism with a, a femtosecond laser. We've already talked about uh, AK, acanthamoeba keratitis, and I, I was reflecting back to when I saw a very exciting and a lot younger Professor Dan Jones uh, uh, when he discovered the, uh, the first case of uh, acanthamoeba keratitis in Texas in a, a rancher who had splashed water from a water trough into his eye and how excited uh, Danny was with this uh, discovery and, and, and uh, certainly he should be credit, uh, cr uh, credited with this, uh, uh, this discovery of uh, something that we now recognize uh, occurs uh, worldwide. You just wonder what, what we used to call acanthamoeba keratitis before Danny uh, identified it. But um, certainly Danny whetted my appetite for cornea and external disease. He kind of made me feel like perhaps everything in ophthalmology is caused by an infection. And so we just had to uh, identify it. And then uh, uh, that was followed up by Dick Forster's uh, willingness to accept me as a, as a fellow. Uh, and uh, I guess um, many of the things I, I know and have, have done in ophthalmology can trace back to Dr. Forster and Dr. Jones. Thank you. So I'd like to talk about this fascination I've had with the, uh, the femtosecond uh, laser and in particular with doing uh, astigmatic keratotomy very precisely. Femtosecond lasers can help correct astigmatism uh, by performing flattening, relaxing incisions and marking uh, something such as the uh, capsule or the limbus for toric IOLs or making special anterior capsule configurations to incorporate uh, specially made uh, IOLs. Uh, relaxing keratotomy is, uh, or astigmatic keratotomy, is dependent on uh, very precise uh, nomograms and putting the treatment at the correct axis, depth, optic zone, and length. The principle is that when we make an incision in the cornea, it opens up. So it's basically an additive procedure on the cornea. It makes it flatter in that area by making it uh, longer. Depth is very important, as just as in radial keratotomy, if we make the incision very shallow, we get no effect, and until we get around 75 to 80 percent depth, do we have any kind of uh, effect. So deeper incisions make uh, 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 deeper uh, or greater effects, and it uh, translates into uh, some imprecision uh, because of imprecision in the depth and imprecision in the outcome. Length is very important. The longer the incision, of course, in arc length, the uh, more effective it is. Optic zone is important. The shorter the optic zone, the more effect uh, as compared to a, a larger optic uh, zone of the same uh, arc length. The position is important. Uh, incisions made in the uh, uh, vertical axis are more effective have more effect than those in the horizontal axis. And the older we get, just as in RK, the greater the effect of the incision on the dioptric uh, flattening of the uh, incision. So there are many inconsistencies with astigmatic keratotomy, uh, including inaccurate assessment of the existing corneal astigmatism, inadequate nomograms with no adjustment for thickness, axis of cylinder, patient's age, et cetera misalignment of the incisions and inconsistent uh, manual, uh, made, uh, manually made incisions. When we make a, a manual incision, it can not only be at the wrong axis, it can be irregular in, uh, in depth and in uh, length. So no wonder that we get these types of inconsistencies. Well, a femtosecond laser could add this precision to these incisions in terms of construction, arc length, optic zones and uh, depths of incisions. With the femtosecond laser, instead of this irregular incision, we can make a very an incision of a very precise uh, depth, length, 
um, and position if we uh, register it right on the uh, cornea. And with the uh, intralase, for instance, the instrument we've had since 2004, um, we've been able to make incisions that we just dial in to the uh, software and make them exactly the way uh, we want to. And I think this has led to improved uh, precision. If we take a, uh, a cornea like this and we can measure the depth with OCT and the position, then we can calculate what we uh, want to do in terms of the, of the depth and the position. It's very important to register where our treatments are on the cornea. We mark the cornea before treatment. We put these little spots on the limbus of the axis of intended treatment, um, make a, a mark across the center of the cornea, mark the center of the cornea, then mark where we're going to actually make the incisions as the optic zone, and then go ahead and make the incisions uh, like this. And so here's just a, a treatment, a patient with seven diopters of keratometric astigmatism post-op, one of uh, Dr. O'Brien's uh, grafts. Uh, I'm only kidding. Uh, and this is usual average in uh, astigmatism. And so we've made the incisions that break through to the surface, and, um, uh, and, and we just open them up uh, manually. And we, in fact, we can titrate these incisions by just manually titrating the depth of, that we want to and sort of gradually titrate up the effect of the uh, treatment. Here's a seven diopter uh, uh, patient preoperatively, and here we are postoperatively with uh, only, two, uh, only a half a diopter a cylinder. But there's a lot of variability in this post uh, penetrating keratoplasty. We've been very interested with our. Uh, ability to, in fact, make the incision so that they don't break through to the surface with some inherent problems that are related to that, such as epithelial ingrowth. With a traditional surface AK on the left, um, we can get, uh, I think, quite uh, variable effects, even in the same in incision on the, on the opposite axis in the same patient. So uh, if you can make an incision with a laser that doesn't break through to the surface, then you can, uh, I think, uh, eliminate some of these inconsistencies. Here's a patient that was unhappy with their uh, multifocal IOL uh, postoperatively with a 1.75 diopters of stigmatism in 2070 uncorrected vision. And um, here's a intrastromal uh, femtosecond AK with the intralase uh, instrument um, not breaking through to the surface. And here we are postoperatively with a half a diopter cylinder in a very happy, comfortable uh, patient uh, uh, very soon postoperatively. Here's another case, a patient with a smaller amount of astigmatism, 1.25 diopters in the uh, horizontal axis. Uh, here's our uh, a picture immediately after we make the uh, intrastromal incision with the uh, laser. Here is a photograph on OCT showing this gap of gas that's there. And um, here we are just a week postoperatively. We see the incision has come back together, but the cornea is flattened. The patient has no more astigmatism and is extremely happy with 2020 and J1 uncorrected vision. So the advantages of a femtosecond intrastromal AK is that it's minimally invasive. There's no discomfort or epithelial ingrowth, much less risk of infection. There's minimal loss of corneal sensation since we're preserving the anterior stroma and the patients uh, tend to be happier. But however, is it is less powerful um, with it being limited to perhaps one and a quarter diopters as we do it now. And we don't have good nomograms established. We're working on that. And uh, titration is, uh, of the effect is less straightforward. And here's the principle. We make the incision in the anterior stroma of the cornea, and it, it basically allows the collagen fibers in that axis to expand. Interestingly, when we've done some in the posterior cornea, it looks like we can get a steepening effect uh, instead of a, a, a flattening effect in that axis. So it may have some uh, additional uh, uh, uses of bandwidth in terms of, of treatment. As uh, Dr. Baye uh, spoke about yesterday, we've uh, been very interested in, in incorporating these relaxing incisions in a laser-assisted cataract surgery. Here's our uh, Optometica team that I've been working with for the last uh, six years now and the catalyst instrument that we've been doing these cases with. And we've been employing a, a liquid interface, much as you would use with uh, an immersion interface for ultrasound to minimize the, uh, any kind of folds or irregularity of the, uh, 
of the imaging or the uh, treatment. And here's, um, here's an image that we get. Uh, we can uh, then uh, just uh, on the spot uh, determine the depth of the cornea and, in, uh, and calculate our incisions topographically just like this as the software envisions uh, on this uh, slide here. Here's one of our incisions made in the Dominican Republic at Dr. Baye's clinic there. And here we see the first incision. We can see that it opens up to the periphery way out by the uh, limbus out here. This is basically a laser uh, limbal relaxing incision. So, um, and here, here we are postoperatively. You can see the precision of these uh, incisions exactly where we'd like it to be. So the femtosecond laser is able to determine the thickness, if it's image guided with OCT, determine the uh, thickness of the cornea at that intended position of the arcuate incision and create an incision exactly the way you want it to be there. But the laser can't determine the axis without some type of outside registration or, ref or reference mark. So either the surgeon must make some external reference marks like this preoperatively that can re uh, orient to or potentially use some kind of automated registration like the uh, sensomotor instrument uh, SMI active tracker that we've been using at Bascom Palmer, not with the laser, but we think we could incorporate this into the femtosecond uh, laser uh, technology to sort of automate the orientation. You could, the laser could be used to make uh, limbal axis markers uh, at the orientation you want. We could make special uh, anterior capsule axis markers to orient toric IOLs, or we could make little uh, interdigitations or uh, uh, fits for a, uh, uh, for a specially made IOL that would interdigitate and uh, make an exact uh, correction. So the essentials are that we get a, a excellent topographic, pachymetric, and uh, nomographic uh, uh, information that incorporates all the variables of the, uh, of the uh, intended correction and get a dependable technique for registration with a femtosecond laser that can be oriented to that registered position and cut these precise uh, corneal incisions at the desired place. So as uh, Yogi Berra says, the future ain't what it used to be. It's a moving target. And I never would have imagined that we, when I started my residency with uh, Dr. Jones that we'd be doing this kind of thing. Did you, Danny? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>